Uh, I really appreciate your friendship and, and guidance. We've been working together on setting up a uterine transplant as well. Um, today, really, I, I want to touch basics because I thought I talk about really interpretation of liver function tests and how you go about looking after and referring patients with um, liver dysfunction uh, during pregnancy. You'll see this is a data, local data from CMC Vello. 8% of the mortality, maternal mortality, is associated with pregnancy-related liver disease. And if you include the hepatitis and other pregnancy-unrelated liver disease, you've got almost more than 30% of these patients, the, the cause of maternal mortality is your liver problem. So it should be a huge problem for you to be concerned about when you see liver, liver dysfunction in these patients. And I'd just like to classify this into two groups to begin with, and then I'll jump on to a third group a bit later. So there are pregnancy-associated acute liver disease and unrelated to pregnancy state that you can have in patients in general but can be more severe in pregnant women. I've circled the two there, the acute fatty liver of pregnancy and hepatitis E virus causing acute liver failure. These are probably the more important causes of pregnancy-related liver disease and mortality. But we'll look at the other things. And I want to go through this in a form of a differential diagnosis. I'm going to put a case there and then explain to you how, how you come to a diagnosis and how you manage these things. Now, pregnancy itself causes abnormalities in liver function tests. I think you need to understand that first. And there are very few, really. The serum albumin in, is low in pregnant women. Part of it is dilutional. Part of it is nutritional. The serum bilirubin can be low. Low bilirubin really means nothing. When you see a patient with low bilirubin, you don't really worry too much about it. And more importantly, the alkaline phosphatase is high in the third, third trimester. And that is uh, probably because of the feet, fetal Sorry, that is due to fetal alpha fetal protein due to mineralization in the third trimester. So you can't look at alkaline phosphatase is raised in livers with biliary, biliary enzyme abnormalities or obstructive pathology or stones, but you have to take it with uh, less importance. What is generally not done in our country as part of a routine liver function test is the gamma GT, gamma glutamyl transferase. And this is also raised in biliary abnormality. Perhaps if you add your gamma GT, you can interpret your liver function test better because you can't rely on alkaline phosphatase in these patients. So that is to remember, alkaline phosphatase can be abnormal, bilirubin can be low, albumin can be low. But if you have a rise in bilirubin, a rise in INR in the absence of DIC there also, and a rise in transaminases, it's not normal. You have to investigate them, even if there are marginal increases in them, because with progression, they can be quite serious. Now, I want to talk about this as a differential diagnosis in three, in three subjects, really, because earlier on we saw pregnancy-associated liver disease and pregnancy-independent conditions, which are usually viral hepatitis, but you also have exacerbation of pre-existing liver disease, many of them with metabolic liver disease, Wilson's disease, even carriers of hepatitis B viruses. These are completely asymptomatic women who can get pregnant, and once they've got pregnant, their liver disease can get worse over a period of time. So let's look at these three categories and how to differentiate them. And it's important to understand that pregnancy-associated liver disease can carry high mortality, both for the mother and the baby. The another point I want you to remember is if there is no baseline underlying liver disease, and if the severity of the hepatitis is not bad, most of or all of the pregnancy-associated liver disease are re reversible. After they have delivered the baby, it is reversible. And the liver, unlike the kidney, has got an enormous capacity to regenerate and to become back to normal completely. So you need to identify these patients early and manage them appropriately so that you can actually get them back to normal. This is not chronic liver disease. The acute insult to the liver is invariably or nearly always reversible, and therefore you need to identify them early. Now, I'm going to touch upon this. This is a practice guidelines, which was from you, Federation of Obstetrics and Gynecology Societies of India as well as the Indian National Association of Study of the Liver Disease. This is a good paper to read for you. 
There are many, many more guidelines, and I'm going to put those as well in between my talk as we discuss these individual diseases. So I'll go through a case history and help you differentiate the various conditions and how we come to a diagnosis. I think this case history probably will cover most of the issues that we want to be de dealing with. So 31-year-old woman, 34 weeks uh, pregnant, first pregnancy, twin pregnancy, we saw earlier on, wherever there is twin pregnancy, your complications are much higher, and comes to you with four weeks history of itching, pruritus. She's, in the last week, has been a little unwell with nausea, vomiting, really general malaise. And she's already seen a doctor or a gynecologist with these symptoms of itching four weeks ago. And at that time, the liver function tests were completely normal. And it was a generalized itch. I want to say a generalized itch because there are some conditions where the itching is really severe in the palms and soles of the feet in the intrahepatic cholestasis. So, Everything that we say, you can exclude certain diseases as you go by, even from the history. And one week history of really feeling unwell and noticing that the urine color is dark. So you examine her. There is no previous diseases, no previous history of really liver diseases in the family or her. There is no drug history, which is very important. There are many drugs which causes cholestasis in these women. They may have been on long term. And there is no travel history for acute hepatitis or anything. Now, when you see this patient admitted in your ward, the patient's alert, there is no encephalopathy, slightly dehydrated perhaps, or may even severely a little bit more dehydrated than you like. And you look at the blood test, the initial blood test, the platelet count is normal. So that immediately rules out certain diseases. We'll talk about that in a minute. The enzymes are raised, AST of 508, ALT of 279, and gamma GT is normal and you're looking at the other blood tests. Now, I told you before, this should raise an alarm because the enzymes should not be raised in these patients. So you automatically start investigating these patients. So you do further tests, and the first thing you want to do is to exclude the common problems first. Your acute hepatitis B, hepatitis A, hepatitis E, which carries a high mortality, CMB, EBV, and you're also looking at bile acids to exclude cholestatic diseases. And you investigate for all the chronic uh, liver diseases that you see in young people. Wilson's autoimmune liver disease, all of that, HCV as a possibility. So you've done these and you want to get a hepatologist or a liver team that you can find or a gastroenterologist you find to tell you what's going on with this patient. Hepatologists don't come very early, I think. He comes at the end of the day, seven hours later and you've been rehydrating the patient in the meantime, in this seven hours, you've already got encephalopathy. I want to concentrate on the liver function tests. I don't know how many of you just look at liver function tests and think that it's abnormal, and therefore I refer. There are many, many interpretations on just this single liver function test and what you have in front of you. This patient is jaundice. The bilirubin is about nine, nine milligrams quite severely jaundice. The enzymes are high, the gamma GT is normal, and the alkaline phosphatase is high. I told you before, alkaline phosphatase being high may not be very relevant, we can't interpret it, but at this level, perhaps it is, there is an element of hepatocellular um, alkaline phosphatase as well. It's not just coming from the bone. But the gamma GT is not, no, not high, and therefore, instantly, you rule out your cholestatic liver diseases. Cholestatic liver diseases can be intrahepatic, it can be extrahepatic. If you worry about extrahepatic, you get an ultrasound scan, you've got no gallstones and the bile duct look normal. Cholestatic liver disease are ruled out. Cholestatic liver disease is also ruled out because you've got encephalopathy. You never get encephalopathy in cholestatic liver diseases. Now let's look at the enzymes, 508. It's 10 times raised or eight times raised, the alkaline phosphatase. That is hepatocellular. Now, I don't know how many of you have experienced acute viral hepatitis. Hepatitis A, you must have had in your family. When you look at the enzymes in acute viral hepatitis, it's in the thousands, it's not in the hundreds. And for a patient to become encephalopathic with the viral hepatitis, the enzymes have to be continuously over thousands, 10,000 sometimes. So looking at this, you can tell 
it's unlikely to be viral hepatitis. You've got a patient who's getting sicker, encephalopathic, may need ventilation very soon. Seven hours the patient's got ventilated. By the morning, I think this patient will be ventilated. Your virology is not going to come immediately. So it's important that you exclude these. So there are many things. The INR is raised, 3.1. Is it hepatocellular or is that a DIC? It can be a viral illness with severe DIC in these patients. Your APTT is normal. So simple investigation. Your creatinine is high, your lactate is high. Possibly the patient was dehydrated. Lactate can be high and liver insufficiency as well. So which just this, we look at the three columns. You've excluded chronic liver disease. The ultrasound has not shown cirrhosis. There is no platelet count is normal. There is no splenomegaly. You've excluded chronic liver disease. You've excluded acute viral hepatitis somewhat. And you've only got the middle column. So let's look at that. I want you to think about it like that. Pre-existing liver diseases. You've done, I mean, these results may not be back. Even with your single liver function test, you can exclude them. The next is pregnancy independent, gallstones and biliary disease. You've done a simple ultrasound scan. You've excluded them. Now there is a possibility, I said, that the enzymes have to be very high in acute viral hepatitis, but in the later, in the later form or in the most severe form of viral hepatitis, the enzymes seem to be coming down because you've not looked after the patient or done blood tests in the last 10 days. The enzymes could have peaked very high, and once the liver cells have died to such a level, there is no more liver cell death happening that much. The enzymes can fall. That's a very ominous sign. If you know that the enzymes have been high earlier and they are falling, it's actually quite a bad. So you still want to really exclude uh, viral hepatitis. You've done your B, and uh, the two that you need to really look at is hepatitis herpes simplex and um, your hepatitis E virus. Herpes simplex is very easy to exclude. You have to wait for it, and you have to treat it. The mortality is very high if you don't treat it. It can be treated with acyclovir. They're typically anectric liver failure in herpes simplex virus, and they've got rashes and other things that you can really make a diagnosis with, and CT scan also shows multiple hypodense lesions throughout the liver. So herpes simplex is not the case. Virology, if you wait for virology, also you can exclude hepatitis E, Hepatitis E is something that you need to seriously worry about. These patients have to be looked after in an ICU by gastroenterologists or hepatologists and manage. Most of these are self-limiting diseases, but if the liver disease is so severe, they can go into fulminant hepatic failure and may not make it. You can't give them ribavirin during pregnancy. The mortality is up to 30% in these patients. So if you think of this as a diagnosis, it's still the same, like the management is the same. It's really a supportive care for these patients. In our country, this is the CMC data. The mortality is very high, almost over 50%. Even in the Western world, when you look at the German data, the mortality is almost 33% for acute hepatitis E virus in pregnancy. So if you look at the practice guidelines, I, I told you about the practice guidelines. There is enough practice. The management of hepatitis E is really like management within an intensive care. There is no need for terminating pregnancy because it doesn't affect the outcome when the, ch when the children recover. But in order to protect the, f the, the baby, sometimes you may have to think about cesarean section in these children, in these, in these women who may be ventilated in an intensive care. Sorry, I'm going backwards. So now we have covered that. There may be a possibility, but the virology is going to come the next day, and therefore you may be able to exclude these as a cause. I'm going to now focus really on what is most important for you, the diseases that you deal with, pregnancy-associated liver disease, and my talk is about that at the moment. So there are three that you have to consider. The intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy, not a very severe illness. It's self-limiting. Don't have to bother too much. Because it is self-limiting and not a severe disease, the current patient we have in hand is unlikely to be in hepatic cholestasis of pregnancy. And you're left only with two of these, acute fatty liver of pregnancy and your HELP syndrome. I hope you all know what HELP syndrome is. It's hemolysis, elevated liver enzyme, and low platelet count. So you've got really the investigative answers for that condition as well. And if you go back and look at the results, we have practically excluded HELP syndrome as well. And you're left with 
intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy. It can start in the second half of pregnancy. Usually it's itching. This is intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy. Self-limiting disease, typically it's in the palms and soles. Our patient did not have. The enzymes can be raised to 400, 500 in these children. Jaundice is rare and it is associated with premature birth and stillbirth. And therefore, if the bilirubin is high, if the bilirubin is more than three or four milligrams per deciliter, one needs to be considering really delivering this uh, child safely in these women at, um, at, a, at a safe time. And you've got the same practice guidelines already, what I've told you, and um, it's, it's, it's quite an exhaustive, exhaustive practice guidelines that they've published, actually. So we've covered intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy, and it's not this condition for this patient. Now let's go into the other two. Acute fatty liver of pregnancy. One in 20,000 pregnancies in the UK. I don't have the statistics here. You all know. Maybe you're seeing more of them than it's in the, thir in the third trimester. Typical symptoms of what we saw. Nausea, general constitutional symptoms. It doesn't, it does, they, some of them have high blood pressure because you don't, I don't want you to uh, confuse this with preeclampsia associated health syndrome because it's not exclusive that uh, these women can also have a high blood pressure. Once it develops into acute liver failure, your mortality is 80% and the fetal mortality is 50% for this condition. I want you to go back to really one fundamental thing. When I say acute liver failure, or the previous terminology was called fulminant hepatic failure, I think fulminant hepatic failure seems like a scary word, but uh, people have abolished that as a word. You have to differentiate this from acute hepatitis. Acute hepatitis is where when you have very, you can be very jaundiced, you can have very high enzymes, it's still not acute liver failure. Acute liver failure, by definition, you have to have encephalopathy. However bad the liver function tests are, it's still not acute liver failure until you have encephalopathy. And until you have encephalopathy, the prognosis is still good and reversible. So we have a patient with acute liver failure by definition, even though the enzymes may not be very high and the prognosis is very poor. And here really, you can, if you do prompt treatment and supportive care, I told you if, you, if you deliver the baby, it is reversible. The, uh, the fatty liver of pregnancy is reversible. It's usually associated with defects in beta oxidation in the mother combined with possibly a, a defect in beta oxidation in the baby. And once you deliver the baby, the, the fatty liver can improve over a period of time. People say biopsy is a gold standard, but biopsy is hardly done in these pregnant women because they, they have a severe fatty liver. Biopsies can cause bleeding, really. These are very soft liver, and true cut needle biopsies can cause uh, bleeding in these patients. Major intra-abdominal bleed is a possibility. But these days we have MRIs and we have uh, really ultrasound scans where they can pretty accurately tell you they are bright livers on ultrasound scan. And with this picture, you can confidently make a diagnosis without a liver biopsy. And you also have set criteria for diagnosing fatty liver disease. This is a Swansea criteria. You've got about 12 in the list. Six out of the 12, your chances of having fatty liver of pregnancy is there. But what is strange about these criteria is you'll see many of them, like vomiting, abdominal pain, polyuria, then you have leukocytosis. You've got five of them which are unrelated to liver, so there will be only one related to the liver. And therefore, really, the accuracy of this criteria is not very good. The negative predictive value is good, but the positive predictive value is not very good with this criteria. CMC Vellore have done a lot of this, actually. They've published really very well on this subject. And they have given you three criteria where when you got liver function abnormalities in the third trimester, and if it is actually acute liver failure, don't confuse it with acute hepatitis. You have, have to have, if you have encephalopathy in these patients with abnormal liver function tests, and there is no other explanation for liver failure, you have to think of fatty liver of pregnancy. And if it is managed appropriately within an intensive care, then you will be able to reduce mortality, even though the fetal outcome have not improved in spite of um, improving the outcome in the mother. And they have shown that over a period of time, the pregnancy, the uh, liver-related mortality in pregnancy has improved tremendously by early identification and managing them within an intensive care setting. So it is essential that they are managed appropriately by appropriate uh, people 
looking after patients with liver failure. And again, whatever we said is what is in this consensus statement. Now, finally, help. We know our patient is uh, fatty liver disease. I can't complete it without talking about help. We know that our patient had normal platelet count. It was 286,000. And therefore, in health, by definition, you have to have a platelet count of less than, less than 100,000. You have to demonstrate hemolysis. You have to have an LDH of more than 600 international units. And uh, abnormal liver enzymes, which is there for common for all of the diseases that you're talking about. And again, the, the, the management for all of these, really, at the end of the day, is the same. It's all about whether you induce a pregnancy or not. But what is strange, really, about um, HELP syndrome, which is different from all other, the, the complication, liver-related complication rates are very high in, in HELP syndrome. You get ruptured livers. The low platelet, in a, in a, there will also be a fatty liver component in these patients. Most pregnant women have a fatty liver. It's not a completely normal liver. They have a very soft liver, which is one of the, we, when we go in the cadaver donor settings, when we have pregnancy-related deaths, we find it very difficult to use these organs because these organs are very friable, which is why I said liver biopsy is a, somewhat a contraindication in these patients. But it's not uncommon to get liver infarcts. It's not uncommon to get ruptured liver and also massive bleeding into the liver as well. Massive bleeding into the liver can cause rupture. Um, and, uh, and, and, and the differentiation between the acute fatty liver of pregnancy and HELP, most of HELP syndrome is in, in the setting of preeclampsia, whereas the acute fatty liver of pregnancy can be independent. You can have it in patients with preeclampsia as well, but the majority of them don't have to have preeclampsia in the fatty liver patients. So that is the differentiating point between the two. You have nausea, vomiting, common symptoms. Jaundice is much more in fatty liver rather than in HELP syndrome. Hypertension is much more in the HELP syndrome rather than in the fatty liver. Acute renal insufficiency is more common in the fatty liver. Coagulopathy is more common. Thrombocytopenia is less common. So if you know the differences, it's very, very easy to differentiate the two and to manage them appropriately. As said before, rupture liver is something that we have seen often in, um, in the HELP syndrome because of low, low platelet count. And these, these situations are quite common. You get subcapsular hematomas in them. And if you don't drain them appropriately, you can have them rupture and have massive intra-abdominal bleeding in these. And, and there are many, many things. The one that you see is an intrahepatic bleed rather than a subcapsular hematoma. And when this happens, the enzymes will shoot up. Um, talking about enzymes, we saw that here is a patient with acute liver failure with encephalopathy, but not high enzymes. I told you in acute liver failure due to viral hepatitis, you get very high enzymes. In viral hepatitis, you get cell death. The hepatocytes are actually destroyed, and the enzymes are released from destroyed hepatocytes, and you get encephalopathy because there are not enough hepatocytes remaining at the end of the viral hepatitis. Whereas in fatty liver disease, you don't have cell death. The function of these livers, the mitochondrial function of these livers is poor, and therefore you get encephalopathy. And that's why the enzymes are not in the thousands and ten thousands. But in HELP, where the enzymes are low, the moment you get intrahepatic bleeding like this, the enzymes will shoot up like viral hepatitis because you will get cell death in these situations. So it's, it's important to understand how to differentiate these things. And ultimately, really, the, the reason why these are managed in liver intensive care is to make decisions about liver transplant. And there isn't a huge experience. In King's College Hospital, we, we did about 12 patients, I think, over a 20-year over a period, liver transplantation. And once you do liver transplantation, you have a reasonable outcome. You're talking about 80% five-year survival. 10-year survival in these patients. And for both fatty liver of pregnancy and HELP syndrome, liver transplants have been done as a des desperate measure. I think I, I will, that's my last slide to say, it's important that pregnancy-associated liver disease are identified early, early, and you can reduce the mortality if they are managed appropriately. And I just want to go through our patient and see what happened to the patient so you understand. 
if you go back to the um, blood test, you can actually only come to one diagnosis here. There is no chronic liver disease. There is no cholestasis because the alkaline phosphate gamma GT is not very high. Ultrasound doesn't show obstruction. The patient doesn't have, patient has encephalopathy and therefore cholestasis is excluded. Chronic liver disease is excluded in our patient. The ultrasound doesn't show splenomegaly. In chronic liver disease, you also have a low platelet count. You don't have that. So we are stuck and it is not uh, pregnancy related intrahepatic cholestasis, the center column. So you're left with HELP syndrome and fatty liver pregnancy. And this is not HELP syndrome because the platelet count is normal. So you've got one diagnosis and based on just this one slide in this patient, you can accurately make the diagnosis. Really, the patient had emergency cesarean section. Both the babies were delivered. Supportive care, including antifungal treatment, it was a confident diagnosis of acute fatty liver of pregnancy without liver biopsy. And you see improvement in liver parameters. And these are the 10 days uh, following delivery. You can see the bilirubin always falls very slowly. The bilirubin sometimes can take weeks and weeks to fall. But what you see is a fall in enzymes. And the fall in enzymes has to be rapid. If the fall in enzymes is not rapid, if the, fall in, the, 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 the enzymes are stable, that means you have got an ongoing insult to the liver. So patients won't recover. As soon as the insult to the liver stops, the cell necrosis stops, and therefore the enzymes should, should fall very rapidly. Both ALT, AST, the half-life of AST is only about 24 to 28 hours. The ALT is between 36 to uh, 40 hours. And therefore, if the enzymes halve each day, you've got no more insult to the liver. If the enzymes fall slowly, maybe there is still some insult. If the enzymes rise or don't fall, there is an ongoing insult to the liver. It's very easy to understand that the liver is recovering just by looking at the enzymes, and the creatinine is gradually improving in this patient. And it is important that you have an MDT meeting about these patients, about appropriate care, maybe liver dialysis, and whether a transplant is necessary or not. The patient was extubated day 15, sent to the ward day 17, and discharged on day, day 20. And I think the family decided not to have, as um, Professor Mani said, this sort of complication where it's a near-death experience they decided that they won't have any other baby in their family. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for the deep insight on the topic. Since there are keynote addresses, I would like to say that uh, we would like all the questions to be during the lunchtime. And, uh, Thank you very much, Mohamed Rella, for having given this opportunity and for us to understand about the liver. I'm sure my gynecologist will not be worried about the liver anymore because he's told you 5% of liver is good enough, but that 5% must be working all right. So I'm very happy about this, uh, Professor Rella. And we will now go in for a quick inauguration, but this is uh, for half an hour only. Lunch will only be served after the inauguration, so don't go to the lunch hall because there won't be any lunch as of now. Okay, so we will start with the inauguration. Can I have the MCs to take over now? <laughs>